All right. Okay. So I guess you guys have, to, you don't have any questions. So let's go back to the presentation for a quick second and we'll come back. So before we start, the thing is that today's sessions would be a bit different, meaning it won't be a normal PowerPoint presentation, which I usually don't like to do, but it's it's very important that we do a sort of PowerPoint to get an understanding for people who are joining in the middle of the session, what is happening around. So what we'll be doing is that we'll try to cover very important topics in PLAB in terms of cardiology, and we'll try to take it from there. And before we start, Anyone else has any questions? Okay, all right. In that case, let me start the session. Guys, can you see my screen? You guys just... Drop a message in the chat box. It would be really helpful to know that. Okay. No, sir. It's not the PPT. Okay. Just your screen. Okay. This is what screen share is loading. Just give it, give it a minute, guys. Okay, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, now is it visible? Can you guys see the screen now? The screen is visible, sir, but... Yeah, okay. It is visible. So if I write cardiology, can you guys see it? Can you guys see it? Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, fine. So, uh, today, the most important topic that we usually cover and which is part of PLAB is MI, myocardial infarction. So, in terms of myocardial infarction, the first thing is about diagnosis. How do you diagnose it? And in terms of diagnosis, you do with uh, drop levels or... Uh, the changes in the ECG. So what they usually give is that they give you an ECG which from which they ask which which artery or let's say which part of the heart muscle is affected. So that is what happens. So first, let's see the different types of MI that we have. First is the lateral wall MI followed by anteroceptal MI. And the third part is lateral wall MI. So the thing is that, uh, sorry, this is inferior wall MI. So this is inferior wall MI. So the thing is that as soon as you see it, the first question is that they'll be asking you to figure out is it a lateral wall MI or an anteroceptal wall MI or inferior wall MI. Then the next question could be what kind of art, uh, which kind of coronary artery is, is affected in this case. So first let me write the changes, the ECD, uh, the ECD changes, which can be... Uh, the ECG changes which can be seen in, uh, let's say, lateral MI and anteroceptal MI. So the leads which are affected in lateral wall MI is lead 1, AVL, and V5 and V6. So the second is... And AVF. And inferior wall MI is V1 to V5. So these are the first things that you need to see in an ECG to, to see what are the changes and if what does the changes indicate. So changes in lead 1, AVL, and V5 and V6 suggestive of lateral wall MI, 
whereas lead 2 lead 3 and avf are suggest of antroceptal and okay so uh, an inferior wall mi is from b1 to b5 so the next thing is that wh what is lateral wall mi and what is antroceptal MI and what is inferior wall MI in the sense that what kind of arteries are affected. So in this, it is left circumflex. I'll tell you, it's uh, it might look like a theory, what I'm teaching, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how, how the questions are framed so that it gives you a sense of why do you need to know the concept rather than just the, uh, you know, MCQs. So this is la uh, left anterior descending artery and uh, this is right coronary artery and left circumflex artery. So if there is a lateral wall MI, it indicates left circumflex artery. And if it's an antroceptal, it, uh, it denotes right coronary artery and inferior wall MI denotes, you know, uh, left anterior descending artery. So now coming to questions. So how the questions can be formed is that they would always give an ECG and they, they would ask you what kind of MI it is or the next thing is that which artery uh, which artery is affected or which which artery is, uh, is causing the ischemia or undergoing ischemia in this case. So this is how they, the questions are framed just from this slide. So three to four questions can be framed from this slide. And the most commonest among them all is that giving you an ECG and asking you what kind of MI it is, or is it an MI or not? So do you guys have any doubts regarding this before I move on to the next thing? You can just drop up any questions. Uh, in the chat room. Okay. Right. So, sorry. Yeah, it's I mean, sorry. Inferior wall MA is V uh, two three and AF, and anterior wall M anti and anterior wall MA is V one to V five. So that's my bad. Yeah. So this is lateral wall MI and antroceptal is V1 to B5 and inferior wall is lead 2, lead 3 and AF. So yes, coming to the next thing. So that is that is one of the most important thing, which let's say that which needs to be, uh, which needs to be told is that left, left main coronary artery occlusion so in this what you need to do is that it shows widespread st depression and it shows an ST elevation in ABR. So this is in case of left main. So when they ask a question of this, of what you do when you get a left main coronary artery occlusion, that's how the question is formed. So first the thing is that whenever you see an ECG, check if it is a widespread ST depression in all leads, it's with ST elevation in AVR because the thing is that this is one of the most important uh, questions where the answer over here is what do you do? What is the next line of investigations that you do in this case? In this case is Emergency coronary angiogram. So in all other cases, they would, uh, you know, 
what is the first first line of management what is the first line of investigations they would go with different like mona or what is the what is the definitive management pci and such stuff but around here the most important thing is that you need to go for emergency coronary angiogram so the left main artery occlusion is a special type of question they ask at some at some point so they just give you an uh, ecg full ecg which clearly shows a widespread st depression in all leads and followed by sorry guys i'm just trying to add people as they come in so widespread uh, st depression and st elevation in avr and the, always choose the choose the answer as emergency coronary angiogram a lot of people go with mona and as as yes that's the management but in case of left main you always go with the emergency coronary angiogram as your first choice so this is regarding the left main coronary artery occlusion and this is regarding the uh, diagnosis of mi just a quick change is that antroceptal is v1 to v5 inferior wall is lead 2 3 lf and lateral wall mi is 1 avl v6 so this is the thing and left main alone every ecg lead is affected which shows widespread st depression and st elevation in avr now coming to management So you go with the usual uh, which is morphine. Oxygen. Nitrate. And aspirin. And along with aspirin. So the thing is that for now, you can just remember clopidogrel is also given. So giving clopidogrel or prasagrel, uh, depends upon what kind of uh, next set is the patient going into thrombolysis or going for a PCA, depends upon uh, the cardiologist choice. However, for PLAP, uh, for our PLAP, they usually tend to stick with morphine, oxygen, nitrate, and aspirin. And aspirin is 300 mg. Okay. And if there is an option which says aspirin with clopidogrel, go for it. But now the guidelines have changed for aspirin with prasagrel. If the patient is uh, is intolerable or any ble bleeding disorders, then we go with uh, clopidogrel. But always prasagrel is uh, preferred over uh clopidogrel according to the latest guidelines but still the thing is that uh for the purpose of the exam you can go with clopidogrel so this is the initial management so coming to the management they always try, try to read the question of it's initial or definitive so the thing is that this is a initial management so always they ask what is the initial management and definitive management. A lot of people get confused. They would go for oxygen. They go. They would go for morphine or nitrate when it's the definitive. And oxygen is always uh, required only if it is less than 94%. And not for every patient, oxygen is not given prophylactically. So this is regarding management, the initial management of MI. The next thing is, the definitive management. Any doubts, guys, still now? Okay. Coronary angiogram, yeah. So that's what you do for left main artery occlusion and definitive management over your PCA and thrombolysis. Okay, so you don't need to remember 
what is rescue pci or what kind of uh, you know uh, what kind of pci yeah, we do when we do a thrombolysis and then we go for the PCI. So just remember about PCI and thrombolysis in a direct sense that if the pressure, if the patient presents with uh, chest pain within 12 hours, we go for PCI. Or if the patient is uh, presents for more than 12 hours and does not have an ongoing chest pain, you go for thrombolysis. Basically, just put it as more than 12 hours. Okay, so the thing is that you need to know that within 12 hours, it is PCI, more than 12 hours, it is thrombolysis. Some people, we say that ongoing chest pain, uh, ongoing PC, okay. Uh, okay, I'll come to your question. Just give me a minute. Okay. Okay, so uh, PCI means... Okay. PCI means it is uh, percutaneous uh, inter coronary intervention. What we do is that we try to put a stent. So we try to put a stent over here. Currently, it is used as radial artery. In our, uh, back in my home country, they prefer femoral, but nowadays, radial is preferred over femoral. And uh, where we do and stenting, and what stent we use now are drug eluding stent. So these are the things like, what kind of PCIs are there? Is it a drug eluding stent? What do we need as, as above PLAB? So in terms of PLAB, what you need to do is that within 12 hours, it is PCI. More than 12 hours is thrombolysis. Some people, even after having thrombolysis, would have an acute chest pain. With uh, Still, ST elevations would be seen. In that case, we would go for rescue PCI. So that's the next question, which common they commonly ask if you if they want uh, if they want it to be twisted, is that they will be asking you. They'll be asking you that the patient who came with the chest pain was done thrombolysis and still there is ongoing chest pain with ST elevation. What do you do? If you go for PCI again, the thing is that as soon as the patient is thrombolyzed, that should be an normalization of the ST elevation. If, the, if that doesn't happen, then it means that the patient requires further management. So always uh, look look for the hours. Has it been four hours, five hours, six hours? So now is the question. They, they would give you six hours and uh, in the background, they would give you six hours in the background ask what is the initial investigation? Because as soon as a lot of candidates who see the hours which are given in the question, they think, okay, this is regarding PCI or thrombolysis. No, that's how people twist the basic questions. So MI is a very basic concept, but still people do tend to make mistakes just because of not reading what is the initial investigations or the initial management and the definitive management. So they just run through the question, oh, okay, uh, morphine is given, uh, oxygen is already, uh, oxygen sats are fine. The only thing to be given is that aspirin 300 mg. Let's go for aspirin, aspirin 3. But at the end of the line, it would be given as and what is the definitive management. So this is it. The, these type of mistakes have been continuously happening till date. So it's just we tend to you know get lost as soon as we see the hours. We think okay, they are talking about definitive management and not the initial management, and we get you know, uh, what to say, get carried away. All right. So now coming to the long-term management. So this is the next question. So am I alone? The myocardial infarction alone, usually a case around three to four cases comes on daily basis. Uh, meaning that in every exam, you get at least three to four cases because on uh, in the wards as well, we see MI on a regular basis. So I would like to just add one thing is that whatever the questions which are asked in the lab are expected to be answered by a doctor who has just passed the internship or who has just completed the internship, which is FY1. They do not ever ask questions which are above, above the level of an FY2. What is required to be as an FY2, that's the question they are asked, not more than that. So 
over here is as inhibitors and the next thing is beta blockers then is the statin and four is aspirin with clopidogrel so in this there are certain things like what are for long term and what are for short term so the first thing is that we give clopidogrel for 12 months and aspirin for lifelong and statin is also for long term the next is beta blockers it is for 12 months and this is for again remember these things it's long term and how long the clopidogrel is given they they usually don't ask but you need to remember what are the four drugs basically it's five drug uh, aspirin and clopidogrel is is combined as an uh, what to say is combined as an uh, dual antiplatelet therapy so it is given as a single drug but it is usually uh, just uh, what to say uh, it is just five drugs as inhibitors beta blockers aspirin uh, statin and clopidogrel so in this again i would like to say that guidelines have changed from clopidogrel to prasugrel it's according to the trust but for the purpose of the exam we can just still keep it as uh aspirin with clopidogrel do you guys have any questions regarding the long term management of uh, am i anyone okay all right in that case let's move on to the next thing which is enstemy so it's basically what is is that any mi which does not have st elevation but have high troponins as well as unstable angina unstable angina is where the drops are normal uh, sorry the ecg is normal but still the thing is that they have an uh, uh, drop drop levels are elevated so what do you do over here is that you give aspirin i'll tell you about something about aspirin dose that you guys needs to uh, know so with aspirin we give low molecular weight which again there are a lot of things and oxaparin found of paranox so you you don't need to you know let's say that you don't need to know about it so usually they give one but again it changes from trust to trust meaning from hospital to hospital purpose of the exam they would give only one which usually is an oxaparin and okay so the next thing is that you get and coronary angiogram in unstable patients so one thing about is that any unstable patient will be taken for a coronary angiogram that's the additional thing that i want to add irrespective of stemi or enstemi or treated with thrombolysis or anything if the patient is still unstable they would go for the coronary angiogram irrespective of whatever the clinical diagnosis at the moment do you guys have any doubts okay so this is about mi i've just tried to summarize it as small as possible among you know uh, okay i have a question yeah so enstemy so this is where we get that is known as an entity known as prince metal angina where there is a mild elevation of uh, drops but again the drops come back to normal because the coronary arteries whenever they cause an spasm 
uh, it causes the elevation of drops but but as soon as the spasm is reduced the drops come down okay so just for now you can keep it as STEMI and STEMI and for That is usually an uh, what? Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what happened. So, uh, regarding NSTEMI, what happens is that there is no ST elevation, but the drops are elevated. This is what happens. And the next entry is principal angina, where everything is normal, but still be considered as an angina. Okay. All right. So, the next after. Uh, what to say? Am I the next important topic is acute pericarditis, which is before I start. So acute pericarditis is important. Okay. So sorry guys. Okay. Acute pericarditis is important because it can be seen for both PLAP1 and PLAP2. So PLAP2, one of the most important clinical scenario for a chest pain. Just giving a heads up, I, uh, I know it's not related to PLAP1, but the thing is that acute pericarditis is something that you need to know because it's it continues with PLAP2 as well. So the first thing you need to know is that it occurs days after MI, okay? So the thing is that this is the most important point because there is some other 918 known as restless syndrome which occurs after weeks. So whenever you see the patient at an MI just two to three days back coming with a chest pain and the chest pain is pleuritic, then it is, uh, you come with Dressler's or acute pericarditis. So now what, what to choose between acute and uh, Dressler's? If it is days, you go with acute pericarditis. If it is weeks, you go with Dressler's syndrome. So the clinical features over here are non-productive cough. So these are not much important clinical feature. So the most important clinical feature is pleuritic chest pain and pericardial rub. So the rest of the things like shortness of breath, tachypnea, tachycardia, those can be present in any in any case scenario. But something which is persistent to acute pericarditis is and wrestlers is pericardial rub and pleuritic type of chest pain. So this is this is how the case comes. They usually give a patient who had an MI uh, last week had come again with a chest pain and they would have given an ECG finding or an ECG picture. I'll talk about the ECG picture in a minute. Before we go to the ECG picture, as soon as you see it, your first choice should go with pericarditis or wrestler syndrome when you see the ECG. So what do you see in an ECG is straddle shaped ST elevation and PR depression. So PR depression is more specific, but For the exam purpose, you can just remember any patient with a saddle shaped ST elevation, uh, ST elevation in all leads after two to three days of an MI is usually acute pericarditis. You guys have any doubts? Okay. 
Okay. So we have just seen why we are de dealing as soon as we are done with MI is that there are certain complications of MI, which comes as the question, which is after two weeks, they have come with this, what is happening after two weeks of an MI, they have come with this complaint, what it is. So if you, if you read MI and uh, post MI complications, you are definitely assured of at least five to six marks because they are forced to ask these questions. No FY2 can be brought into the job without knowing what is MI and what are the post complications of MI. So this is the most important thing. You need to know without this topic being covered in a question paper, we will not be able to uh, let's not complete. Uh, let's not say we complete the question paper. We do not fulfill the criteria of completing the syllabus required for the question paper. So always MI and the post MI complications are always part of the question paper. Now management is analj six, and the next thing is NSADs which is IV Birofen and to give Colchisin if they are allergic to NSADs and to prevent as well. And one more important thing is that reduced physical activity. You can read this everything because the thing is that the same case comes for PLAP2. Pericarditis comes for plateau where you need to talk about these things and what you do, it's an additional information. You guys can take it. We do an echo. We always do an echo to see if there is any, any sort of fluid collection or thrombus. And this is only required for plateau, not for plat one. However, the thing is that we always say that we are going to do one jelly scan of your heart to see what is wrong. Okay, any doubts? Okay, so, okay. So the thing is that what happens is that pericarditis is sort of an autoimmune condition or it could be an infective condition. Let me give you the what to say etiology or process or pericarditis, which is viral infection. And post MI. TB and the most important thing is connective tissue disorder. If it is a connective tissue disorder, it's a long term, then we we need to proceed with purchasing rather than NSAD because NSAD is always short term. So the most important thing over here is that for PLAB1, you need to remember post MI. And for uh, PLAB2, you need to remember viral infection because they say we came with cough and flu-like symptoms. And there is something known as methotrexate. Again, we go if, if, they are, if they are not tolerable to colchicine and as well as NSAIDs, we go with methotrexate as well. But I haven't included it because it is again persistent to PLAB2. Remi. Week after MI. Sorry about this. So they come with, with chest pain after weeks, whereas in pericarditis, they come after days. Clincher. Over here is. So this is what happens. 
they always give the pleuritic chest pain shortness of breath tachycardia tachypnea and ecg changes but they come after one week minimum maximum one month this is the difference between acute pericarditis and restless syndrome do you guys have any doubts okay Right. Okay, so let me please repeat. So I'll just tell you very uh, short and crisp as required for the exam. The thing is that there are two entities known as restless syndrome and acute pericarditis. Both can come after an MI present with the same kind of clinical features, which is non-productive cough, pericard uh, rub. pericardial rub is not a clinical feature, it's a clinical sign. So uh, pleuritic chest pain, tachypnea, tachycardia, fever, shortness of breath, and same with restless syndrome. The only thing is that if the pericarditis features are occurring minimum of after one week to one month, plus syndrome, and if it occurs after days after an MI, it is known as acute pericarditis. So this is the most important thing you need to know. If it is after days, it is acute pericarditis. After weeks, it is. Uh, that's what difference between. Okay. So the thing is that when you have a shortness of breath, why do you get shortness of breath? Is that whenever you have a pleuritic chest pain, you you cannot take a deep breath. Let me see if my camera is on. Okay, my camera is on. So the thing is that when you take a deep breath, you are not you will have a very, very, very pleuritic chest pain because there's a pleural prep. Okay. So the thing is that when, when you cannot take a deep breath, what you do is you take a, a short breath. So the proper oxygen is not, is, is not circulated or taken in. So you always have shortness of breath and which accompanies with the chest pain and panicking, which definitely makes you you know, uh, hypoxic. So the shortness of breath in pericarditis is not because of, let's say that hypoperfusion, it is because of the pleuritic chest pain, which causes the shortness of breath. Okay, guys. So, got it, thank you. All right, any doubts? Uh, all right, so next thing is, left ventricular, aneurysm. So, as you already know, it is because of the aneurysm which takes place. Aneurysm is nothing but the dilatation the chambers. So, what it can cause is usually what it causes is that it causes shortness of breath because the aneurysm is a if causes reduced pumping and it results in a reduced cardiac output. So those things are not necessary. The most important single line clincher for this is very, very easy. Which will give you the answer is Persistent ST elevation after an MI. For uh, let's take the persistent elevation for four to six weeks. So this is how you diagnose left ventricular aneurysm. Any patient they say. Uh, the patient had an MI three to four weeks ago and come with uh, has come again for a follow up checkup and the ECG was taken which shows in pers persistent ST elevation. What does that mean? Does the patient have MI? No, it is left ventricular anne aneurysm which causes the persistent ST elevation. So over here, what do you do is initial. ECG definitive is echo.
any doubts my definite was spelling is wrong anyway so the thing is that uh, initial is ecg and definitive is echo and what do you need whenever you see an aneurysm is possibility of emboli so treatment is anticoagulation so these are the things that they do not usually ask i'm just letting you know the two questions from left ventricular aneurysm is diagnosing left ventricular aneurysm and what is the definitive diagno uh, definitive investigation for diagnosis which is echo all right any questions okay so next thing is cardiac tamponade so i'll tell you certain things but i'll just finish this topic then i'll go on with it so any questions uh, any questions before we move on to cardiac tamponade no questions so as the name suggests it's cardiac tamponade meaning there is an effusion around the heart which stops uh which which uh inhibits the pumping of the heart and the causes over here are trauma and the next thing is post amy complication okay so how do you diagnose cardiac tamponade the easiest thing is dyspnea sorry low bp muffled heart sounds and rise jvp so always all these patients will have low bp muffled heart sounds and rise jvp so it looks very very easy still people miss this case okay i'll tell you why so the thing is that they would not give the same wordings so you could see a bp over 60 over 40 or something like that and they would give an abnormal heart sounds and they would give the venous pressure jugular venous pressures have been so and so and the normal level could be given in the bracket so the thing is that you need to get an idea of what it is what what is that they are trying to say because a lot of people say that the triad was not given triad the triad is given but it would be hidden somewhere hidden somewhere in the sense uh, it's not like completely hidden it's just on your face you just need to go with the flow and see okay low bp abnormal heart sounds and the jvp looks right what could be the complication the patient had a recent mi so it is cardiac tamponade so this is what you need to know about cardiac tamponade and the next thing is that what is the initial investigation and diagnostic okay so the initial thing what you do is and just x ray which shows an enlarged heart the diagnostic is echo so this is okay i'll tell about cardiac tamponade how it causes uh how does trauma causes cardiac tamponade so the basically it's it's quite straight forward the thing is that if you have an a road traffic accident and there is a very sharp injury to your chest so it can just pierce the covering of the heart and it can just bleed and that's how cardiac tamponade is caused so the trauma over here is that direct trauma to the heart is what they mean nothing else treatment is always a b c d e and in this i don't think e will be there 
followed by cardiosynthesis. So if, the thing is that the same thing you will learn both in emergency medicine as well as in pericardiosynthesis. The thing is that you need to see the question very clearly. Is it initial or definitive treatment? So the same things goes for initial and diagnostic. A lot of people miss it as soon as they see they go for pericardiosynthesis, but the initial question would be, what is the initial management of the patient, which would be checking the airway and giving him some oxygen because the thing is that he would be hypoxic. All right. So any question? Okay. Now, like they say, like one of the Dr. Amu who asked, what do you do in a trauma? It's not pericardiosynthesis. Any patient with trauma, with cardiac arrest, which is due to, let's say that uh, trauma with cardiac arrest, which is because of uh, uh, cardiac tamponade, the management is thoracotomy. Okay, again, this is additional. You don't need to know it. They don't ask it. But the thing is that if it is a trauma, which is, cardiac, uh, which is causing a cardiac tamponade and the patient has went into RS, the, the most appropriate or definitive is thoracotomy. Do you guys have any doubts? Any doubts at all? Okay. So in this case, let's stop this and I want to show you guys something. Oh, one minute. Can you guys see this uh, slide share or my screen? Can you guys see my screen? Okay. Yes, yes. Thank yeah, we, we, we see it. Okay. Thank you. So the thing is that we tried to cover some important topics in cardiology today. I, I was just able to complete three to four topics. So what I wanted to talk to you about is that I've seen a lot of people asking about what kind of preparation is required for PLAB and what does it require to pass it in the first attempt. So the thing is that I think this, this quote would answer a lot of questions. There is no elevator to success. You have to take the stairs. I know it's a, it's it sounds cliche, but the thing is that's the most important thing. You need to know the concept. All I say is that you need to know the concept. A lot of people just go through the plappable and they expect the questions to be repeated in the same manner without any changes, which happens, which happens, which literally happens around 20 to 30 percent. Okay which is around 20 to 30 percent, not more than that. And with the days we are approaching, the thing is that it is twisted. It gets twisted a lot. And the most easiest way to approach a case is if you know the concept. If you know, post time my patient comes with a pleuritic chest pain, okay, everything is fine, but there are two conditions which comes after weeks and which just comes after days. So if it's days, it's pericardial. It is if it's after weeks, it is uh, restless syndrome. And what do you need in a cardiac tamponade with a trauma? The management is thoracotomy and not uh, pericardiosynthesis is not for every case. So these are the things that you need to know. Okay. So it is really, really important that you understand the concept irrespective of however the questions are framed and however 
you know, however they twist the questions. So now I would like to talk about ourselves, what we have been doing for uh, as part of the study medics as we have been running courses very constantly for MRCOG and MRCP. And we have been, there are certain things which have been left out. The thing is that we are doing MRCS as well. And we have been doing FMG exams and a lot of other things rather than whatever you see in the screen. We do a lot more than what it is given on the screen. Now, coming to, you know, what are the, like I said, like I said, what are the things which are, which are, you know, which are really required which are really required to pass the exam is that you need to have a schedule and you always need to know what are the topics to cover. Like I told you just now, without asking a question of MI or a post MI, they would never give you a question paper. They would never, they never would uh, give a question paper because it does not complete the question paper. Any case without a diabetes would not be given because these are the couple of few things that you see on a daily basis when you come and work here. So you need to have a generalized idea of what are the things that I can never miss. So, uh, so the thing is that what we try to do is that we have podcast. So it, it helps you to recall stuff. And we have a lot of mocks, uh, mini mocks, which are now being circulated among our website from last week. And I don't think stress reduction would, would work anywhere. You're always stressed. I don't think this is appropriate at any point of time. However, yeah, choose your brand wisely. Yes, the thing is that over here, I, I would like to stress that I've, I've been teaching PLAB, PLAB for one year, uh, both PLAB 1 and PLAB 2. And the thing is that with the right guidance, it's easy to pass, especially PLAB 2. And the thing is that if you know this is how the exam or the questions are formulated, it is very quite easy. And the most important thing is that you don't need to spend more than three to four hours a day in order to uh, study for the exam. So that's how the lab is designed. It is designed to, you know, it is designed to combine both your work as well as your studies. It doesn't uh, require like any sort of, uh, uh, you know, the post-graduation exams in India or Pakistan or anywhere else where it requires your constant uh, you know, your constant uh, input or your constant uh, like 10 to 12 hours a day into the uh, into the studying process. PLAB is quite easy if you have the correct guidance and you spend three to four hours a day. And that's what we are trying to do. This is something for the PLAB, uh, May exam that we are planning to do. It's a seven day quick revision course and the registrations are open. And you can you can register with us. And we are doing a long course, meaning for people who have an August exam, we are planning to do a three month course from June, July uh, till August till your exam uh, to give you a complete support throughout the exam. And the details regarding it will be shared in the future. But for now, regarding the main course, is that it's it's six live sessions and two mocks and you get a one-on-one -on -one mock discussion and the thing is that these are live sessions whatever i took today it's the same thing okay and i can see that it is it is said that made available in your course library accessible till the may exams it's fine it's fine to access uh, you know it's fine to access library but i strongly prefer that you sit and attend the live session, make time or take a day off from work and do it rather than you using the recorder sessions at your own free time. Because the thing is that at the end of the day, it's really, really important. Uh, okay, someone has texted me. What are the subjects are in PLAB 1? Okay, I'll, I'll answer the question. So before that, so that's what my personal opinion is that when the live sessions are there, try to attend the live sessions because there is a lot of questions a lot of things which are happening and you are able to, you know, uh, do you, you are able to, you know, get, do you have any feedbacks? Okay, I'll answer this question. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, a lot of questions. I'll just answer one by one. So 
Okay, the rest three points I'll cover later. First thing, what are the subjects in plan? Lab one. So the thing is that the plan one covers the topics of second year, third year, and final year of your exam, uh, medical school, meaning that it covers all your internal medicine, a uh, bit on your, uh, uh, let's say that internal medicine in the sense it will cover all your internal topics, cardiology. Uh, dermatology and all those stuff and apart from that non-clinical subject what you get is that uh ethical scenarios okay so that's something we have never read so ethical scenarios are quite common nowadays a bit of statistics again it's not like community medicine which comes in our country so much of questions no it's maximum you need to go through 10 questions to if by any chance they ask a statistic question because Statistics now is not a topic to check if you're eligible to work as an FI2. Always think if you before reading a topic, is this required as an FI2 as a doctor who has just completed internship? So statistics does not fall under that criteria. So and apart from that, you need to know about pediatrics, obstetrics, and gynecology. You need to know about general surgery, all the things about internal medicine, and you need to know about optal, ENT, and uh, I don't, uh, anatomy, you need to know a bit. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. I, I'll, I'll, I, I'll just slow the sl uh, sh uh, slides just before that. So the thing is that this is what is covered in PLAB and what else? I missed anything. No. Vascular, again, the vascular comes under internal medicine. So basically, there is no non-clinical subjects. Biochem is never ever asked. Physiology a bit. Again, these are just five to six questions that you need to know, not more than that. The, the majority of the questions are the, from the final year subjects, which needs to be covered. I hope this answers your question. Do you have any feedback of the passing rates of your previous candidates? Yes. So the thing is that if you, if you go into our website, you might see the feedbacks given by our previous candidates and the testimonials and the feedback forms. So yes, and regarding the, what is the uh, pass rate? So we had five to six, uh, not five to six, people who have registered for our course, they passed the exam, but there was a WhatsApp uh, page, a WhatsApp group that I, I used to, you know, uh, take care for the exam. I guess more than a lot of people have passed over it. Because the thing is that, uh, because uh, the thing is that after passing the exam, I asked them, "What was your feedback? And do do we do you think uh, what kind of teaching was it useful?" And they said it was really useful. However, the thing is that as more than hearsay, you can check our website to see the testimonials. And you will be able to get it. Okay, okay. A lot of people. Okay. First, the next question, do you have to prepare? Yeah, the thing is that it's the same. The thing is that the exam gets a bit tougher every year because the thing is that they try to twist the questions more. But however, the thing is that the pass rate is always, be, the pass mark is always between 115 to 119, not more than that or not less than that. It's always that. I've never seen a score more than 120 till date. Okay. And next thing. Biochem does not come. That's what I was saying. Bio, biochem does not come. I guess someone has raised a hand, is it? If, if so, you can just unmute yourself. No. Okay. No one raised their hand. Fine. So, uh, coming back to... Hello, sir. I have a very confident. Can you please show me the slides which I've discussed previously today due to some internet connections? Okay. I'll, let, I'll show you. Can you guys see my screen now? Okay. Can yes, you guys sir. see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So the thing is that what we try to cover today is cardiology. And the first thing is the diagnosis of lateral wall MI 
Antroceptal in inferior wall MI, the thing is that the arrows are wrong. Inferior wall MI is LEAD2, LEAD3, AVF, and antroceptal is V1 to V5. Lateral wall is 1 AVL and V5, uh, V5 and V6. And the next thing is that we talked about left main artery, coronary artery occlusion, because it's a separate entity which requires an emergency coronary angiogram. So you definitely need to go through that. And management which is the initial management that we talked about, which was monomorphin oxygen, nitrate, and aspirin, along with clopidogrel or prasagrel. Just remember, for example, clopidogrel, leave about prasagrel. And oxygen is always given if they do not, uh, if they're not above the target chance. And yeah, management is again PCI, thrombolysis, and within 12 hours, PCI more than... 12 hours is thrombolysis, long-term management is ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, statins, aspirin with clopidogrel. Okay, so it, it goes on and on. So I'll just tell, we covered MI, pericarditis, and restless syndrome, and left ventricular aneurysm. These are the things that we covered. Okay. So will the pattern for PLAB, yes, Okay, so now people are asking if the uh, if the PLAB has been changed to UCMLA, will it change? No. At the end of the day, the thing is that the exam is for, are you eligible for an FI2 position or not? It doesn't, it, it is irrelevant if the name of the exam changes from PLAB to UCMLA. The questioning is going to be the same because they are just checking, are you eligible for an FI2 position? both PLAB1 and PLAB2. Even if it changes into UKMLA part one and part, uh, part two, it's the same. So guys, so the thing is that before uh, I go, I hope the session was useful and uh, hope some some sort of help or you, had, you got an idea how to study for PLAB. And if you guys have any more doubts or questions, you can always post uh, a question in our chat room and one of our people will be able to guide you to the right person and please show page number five okay you can show it so this is page number five so yeah so uh, this is what i wanted to tell you so this is what i wanted to tell you was that uh, we have a lot of different kind of teachings. So it is just, that's not about, you know, uh, just setting out a slide or giving you questions. It is all about pro providing the enough and the necessary support to pass the exam in the first attempt. So this is it guys, do you have any questions? Okay, so that could be an ECG class. I'll let you know that is in another webinar which is coming up. I'll make sure that the details of the webinar are posted in the group so that everyone knows. And uh, are you taking a screenshot? Hmm. You can. This is seven and this is eight. That's it. Okay, guys. Thank you for joining today's session. I hope it was useful. And the thing is that, okay. Do you have to pass, do you have to subscribe Plappable or just attend your course? The thing is that it is it is useful to attend our course and do the mocks and as well as the Q banks and it will definitely help you to pass the exam. And yeah, really helpful. Doc, thank you so much. Very helpful. All right, guys. Thank you very much for attending the session and please give your feedbacks.
in our WhatsApp group where you were able to get the registration links so that we'll be able to, you know, get more sessions. All right. So just give your feedbacks in the WhatsApp groups wherever you got the registration links or the Facebook groups where you got the registration links. And that's, I think one of my team members is trying to post the links of our WhatsApp groups. So please get into our WhatsApp group and let us know how was the session so that we'll be able to do more sessions. And we have a lot more in the paid versions where a lot of audio, audio books, flashcards, a lot of things are available. It was nice to hear from you. It was nice uh, taking a session. I mean, it's after a long time I've been taking a session. Anyway, the thing is that, yes, please join the group and there is more for the paid versions and the mocks and the questions and the uh, courses. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. So I don't know where do you, I've seen that there's something on a splat pots. I don't know. The thing is that where did you get it? It could be the plap podcast. So we do have podcast. It's an audio podcast, which just summarizes about a particular, let's take pericarditis within five minutes. That's what our podcast is all about. Any more questions? How can I get it? Yes, you can just ask one of our team member or you know, get into the registration or the WhatsApp group and tell them and they'll be helping, uh, they'll be guiding you. All right. And yes, please let us know about the session. And yeah, any doubts or anything, you can just pop your question in our chat room in the WhatsApp. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.